Good morning. This is Northern Light for Wednesday, November 8th. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. We've got a rundown of election results coming up, including in Clinton County, where Republican Kevin Randall won his race, which keeps the legislature split. It's so humbling to get the support and, and to be elected into a position of any type, but especially the county legislator, I think I can do a lot to help the uh, residents that I will represent in Area 5. Voters in Lewis County re-elected a sheriff with ties to far-right groups. And according to unofficial election results, both ballot amendments passed. One allows towns to go beyond their debt limits to update their sewer lines. The other amendment removes the debt limit for small city school districts. Also, we caught up with voters about how they feel about the state of democracy in the U.S. today. I think we had to change everything they had got. Everybody should be replaced. Look what's going on. We're not in a war. I'm frightened. I'm very frightened. I, I, I don't know how to describe it other than I'm, I'm fearful. And Chef Curtis has a recipe for us to help plan our Thanksgiving table. All of that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Mountain Orthotic and Prosthetic Services, a full-service practice committed to providing care for patients of all ages with offices in Lake Placid, Plattsburgh, and Malone. Details and referrals at mountainonp.com. And by St. Lawrence Health, offering my care away for patients to access health information and stay connected to their care team. Registration is available at stlawrencehealthsystem.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. According to unofficial election results, voters passed both proposed amendments to the state constitution yesterday. According to the New York Times, the first will allow cities and towns to go beyond their debt limits to build new sewage facilities. They currently have this power, and the measure extends it for 10 more years. The other amendment removes a debt limit for small city school districts. Smaller districts have argued that the limit is unfair when they're trying to tackle more ambitious projects to improve schools and that all schools across the state should be treated equally. These results are still unofficial with 91 percent of precincts reporting. The Clinton County Legislature will remain split between Republicans and Democrats. That's because the GOP held the seat representing Area 5, which covers Schuyler Falls and parts of the towns of Peru and Plattsburgh. Kara Chapman has more. Republican Kevin Randall beat Democrat Rick Hazen by about 13 percentage points, according to unofficial tallies. Randall is a retired corrections lieutenant, longtime volunteer firefighter, and current supervisor for the town of Schuyler Falls. Reached by phone late last night, Randall said he appreciates the support voters gave him. It's so humbling to get the support and and to be elected into a position of any type, but especially the county legislator, I think I can do a lot to help the uh, residents that I will represent in Area 5. The legislature has been evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, with a Republican chair and Democratic deputy chair for the last few years. It'll appoint its leaders at its organizational meeting in January. Also in Clinton County, voters re-elected Republican John Zerlo Sr. to an eighth term as county clerk. Unofficial results showed he beat Democratic challenger Brandy Lloyd by more than 1,100 votes. Zerlo ran on his experience in the position. Lloyd is the county's deputy Democratic elections commissioner. And county residents elected Amy Asadorian Senecal as their new family court judge. She was the Democratic and Working Families candidate. Asadorian Senecal is the current family court support magistrate. She beat Hillary Rogers, a chief assistant public defender for the county, by 18 percentage points. Asadorian Senecal is the second person and first woman elected to the position. Kara Chapman, North Country Public Radio. Many North Country races had few contenders, but in the Adirondacks, the town of Wilmington, which has less than 800 year-round residents, had six candidates vying for three open positions, town supervisor and two spots on the town council. The hot-button issue there is short-term rentals. One quarter of homes in Wilmington are listed on sites like Airbnb and Verbo, and debate over their regulation or lack thereof has been the major issue. Three candidates have been outspoken about being pro-short-term rental regulation, while the other three have favored less. Amy Fireisel spoke with Wilmington voters on Election Day. 
My name's Rick Whitney. I live in Wilmington, and we're here in Wilmington, New York. I came out to vote um, to support um, a regulation on short-term rentals because I'm originally from Lake Placid, and um, short-term rentals have really changed the community. I don't want to see that happen here. And from what I understand, it's become quite a hot-button issue in the town. Absolutely. um, Probably the biggest issue. Unfortunately, it's very controversial, but I hope that you can meet somewhere in the middle. Hi, my name is Marilyn Monsko. Lived in Wilmington now for 38 years. I'm not really uh, concerned about it. I think um, it does bring some people in at, uh, you know, good times of the year. And it does make things high for the people that want to live here, the young people. That's, you know, that would be my biggest issue, that uh, it's taking rentals away. Hi, my name is Charlie Terry, and I live in Wilmington. I personally think people are looking at it all wrong. Short-term rentals are not the problem. It's people coming from the cities paying way too much for the properties, and people, local people can't afford the property. Beyond that, being an old redneck that's lived here my whole life, it's none of your business what I do with my property. So I personally think STR is a joke. It's nothing to do with the election whatsoever. Voter turnout in Wilmington yesterday was extremely high. More than 600 ballots were cast in a town that recorded 775 people in the 2020 census. And margins were razor thin close. According to unofficial results, Favor Smith won town supervisor by just 18 votes. He was the candidate with uh, with a more moderate approach to regulating STRs. On the town council, Laura Hooker and Darren Forbes got the most votes. They're split on how to handle short-term rentals. In Watertown, Sarah Campos Campo Pierce will be the city's first mayor, who's a woman. Catherine Wheeler reports Campo Pierce handily defeated Lisa Ruggiero in Tuesday's election. Unofficial results from the Jefferson County Board of Elections shows that Sarah Campo Pierce won nearly 70% of the vote, while her opponent, Lisa Ruggiero, received close to 30%. Campo Pierce says she's excited for the new challenge. It's also incredibly uh, humbling for me to be the first woman in this position. It's a history-making moment for the city, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity, and I look forward to giving 110% to the position, which is what the city residents deserve. Campo Pierce said as mayor, she'll be focusing on fixing what she calls the dysfunction that's become common at city meetings. One of the first things that I am looking forward to doing is working with the new council members to uh restore our meetings to a point of civility and being more productive for the people of Watertown. We definitely have some significant tasks ahead for the city and significant uh, efforts that we need to work toward. Compo Pierce said a top priority for her will be improving the city's drinking water quality, along with improving the city's fiscal responsibility. She said she also wants to look for opportunities to collaborate with nearby communities. Campo Pierce has been on Watertown City Council for nearly five years. Watertown City Council is nonpartisan. Candidates for council and mayor don't have a party affiliation. Also in Watertown, Ben Schoen and Robert Kimball have been elected to the two open city council seats. Ruggiero will maintain her seat on the council. Catherine Wheeler, North Country Public Radio. Voters in Lewis County re-elected Sheriff Mike Capanelli. He has ties to some far right wing groups and has become known for refusing to enforce certain state laws. As Emily Russell reports, Carpinelli won yesterday's election in a landslide. Lewis County Sheriff Mike Carpinelli was up against retired state trooper Nicole Turk. They're both Republicans, but Turk lost in the primary, so she ran on the conservative party line. She campaigned on the idea that the county needed a change in its top law enforcement official. According to unofficial election results, Carpinelli beat Turk by a 30-point margin. That's an even bigger landslide victory than the last time he was challenged in 2015. One county legislator recently described Carpinelli as the most popular politician in Lewis County. He's gained popularity over his 12 years as sheriff for pushing back against certain gun laws and COVID health mandates. Carpinelli has also been public about his ties to two far-right groups, the Oath Keepers and the Constitutional Sheriffs. 
While some of his supporters are unaware of those ties, others say they support Carpinelli's affiliations with those kinds of groups. Carpinelli said earlier this year if he was reelected, he'd focus on addressing the opioid epidemic in Lewis County and encouraging lawmakers to roll back the statewide bail reform. Emily Russell, North Country Public Radio. Potsdam will have a new mayor, Democrat Alex Jacobs Wilkie, a village trustee and SUNY Potsdam communications director, cruised to an easy victory in unofficial results Tuesday with 94 percent of the vote. She beat write-in candidate Joseph Bowen, who recently moved to Potsdam. Sharon Williams and Lindsay Schult will uh, won the two open seats for Potsdam village trustees. In Canton, Democrat Randy Brown and Republican Bob Santamore won seats on the town council, defeating Democrat Wayne Cuthbert. Michael Dalton ran unopposed for re-election as the village of Canton's mayor. Anna Sorensen and Barbara Beekman won two village trustee seats. In Ogdensburg, voters elected a new mayor, Democrat Michael Tooley, who ran unopposed after controversial mayor Mike Skelly didn't seek re-election. In the town of Webb, which includes Old Forge, incumbent Republican town supervisor Bonnie Baker defeated Democrat David Burkstresser, getting 66% of the vote. And Kyle Lindsay and Benjamin Hanna won two council seats. And Republican Nancy Russell won the town clerk position. The village of Malone re-elected its mayor Tuesday night. According to unofficial results, Republican Andrea Dumas beat Democratic challenger Mary Scharf by about 25 points. Scharf previously served as the Malone, on the Malone Town Board. Dumas will now serve her second four-year term as mayor. She's also a member of the Franklin County Legislature and a community liaison for State Senator Dan Steck's office. Voters in multiple North Country counties chose new county clerks last night. In Essex County, Republican Chelsea Maryhew beat New Visions Party candidate Stephanie DeZalia. Maryhew has served as acting county clerk since the previous clerk retired last year. Voters in Hamilton County overwhelmingly elected Rochelle Martz. She was the Republican and conservative candidate. Warren County voters selected Democrat Carrie Black to succeed longtime county clerk Pamela Vogel. And in Washington County, Lisa Boyce beat incumbent clerk Stephanie Cronin. Boyce ran on the Republican and conservative party lines. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 813. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Just ahead, Chef Curtis Hem shares his recipe for a Thanksgiving side dish showstopper. That's coming up in just a few minutes here on Northern Light. Music by Potsdam guitarist Oscar Sarmiento. Northern Light is supported by Blue Seed Studios, Saranac Lake, promoting community involvement in the arts on the web at blucstudios.org. And by St. Lawrence Nurseries, Potsdam, accepting orders now through April 12th for cold hardy fruit and nut trees. Details at slngrow.com. team was out reporting on election day yesterday they asked north country voters how they feel about the current state of democracy the people we talk to see a lot of division and polarization nationally but they're more optimistic about their local governments i live in saranac lake my name is richard moles i think we had to change everything they had got everybody should be replaced look what's going on we're not in a war but we're spending billions of dollars over there. Not for me. 
I'm frightened. I'm very frightened. I, I, I don't know how to describe it other than I'm, I'm fearful. I don't know. We were watching the news this morning where we, I got to watch Trump. Uh, he acted like my, my teenagers that I teach. Like he was, he wanted to pick a fight with people. And I'm afraid that that's what society is becoming, that politics is picking a fight. It's not knowing what you want. It's just to pick a fight with somebody. I'm Kristen Remington Donahue. I live right here in Canton. Jim Donahue. I live here in Canton. Like Kristen, I think that there is a lot of fight picking happening. I think democracy is under attack largely by the people we're voting for. I I have very little faith in, I don't know, you might just call it the machine or corporate interests. And it's, um, I think that's why it's particularly important to vote for local measures. I think that's where we have the most local control and where we have the strongest voice. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Houston. I live in the township of Jay. I think if you look at the town of Jay, our local government, I think it's pretty diverse. If you look at our town council and everything, you know, other people have moved here from the outside, but we used to call outsiders. In any event, I think they bring uh, new ideas uh, to the table. You know, I, I'm a conservative Republican, and maybe they're progressive Democrat. I don't know. But on this level, I think we find a lot of common ground. You know, we can't just stay the same as we were when I was... 16 or 17 nationally i think we're very weak um i think the world sees it you know there's a lot of bad players in the world and we don't have a strong administration if you want to have a peaceful world you have to do it from a position of strength so i am Jeannie nichols and i live in upper j new york i think the state of our democracy is in trouble and people need to participate we need to get mr trump not on the ballot Hi, my name is Paul Reno, and I live in the town of Osable. Hi, my name is Priscilla Reno. Well, I believe that democracy is um, really under terrible um, pain. Just the way people are killing each other, we don't have the right gun laws, and I also uh, think it's a civic duty to vote. That's, it's one thing that's very, very important to us, that we're given a say in how this country should should be governed and we have a certain view that it should be governed by the constitution and we see so many people across the country and people who are who are in high places who just are turning their backs on that that was Richard Mose, Kristen Remington, Jim Donahue, Jeffrey Houston, Jeannie Nichols, and Paul and Priscilla Reno all talking about how they feel about the current state of democracy. New York State's early voting numbers are in. Karen DeWitt reports while the numbers are low, they vary depending on where some competitive races were held. According to numbers released by the New York State Board of Elections, just over 3% of voters cast their ballots during early voting, which ended Sunday. The board's Kathleen McGrath says that number is about the same as previous off-year elections that feature only local races. Early voting unofficially, uh, we we had just shy of 400,000 early voters in New York State over the nine days of early voting. That is Somewhat on par with 2021, the last odd year where there was just about 409,000. In counties where there are competitive races like Albany, Erie, Ulster and Columbia, the early voter turnout ranged from 5.5% to over 7.5%. Susan Lerner is with Common Cause, a government reform group that championed early voting. She says when voters perceive that there's something at stake, they will appear at the polls. People are very responsive to the uh, importance they place on their vote in a particular race. We see this over and over again, that if there is a competitive race in which voters are very interested, more people will vote. It's pretty simple. Lerner says she does wish, though, that turnout rates, even in years with fewer races, were higher. But she says early voting can play an important role in fixing any glitches in the system. And we have examples of how that actually helps solve problems before we get to election day. We have one county that had a problem with their electronic poll books on the first day of early voting. Voting started uh, approximately what I understand 45 minutes late in that county. 
but they're able to solve the problems. With next year being a presidential election year, early voting and election day voting rates are expected to be much higher. In New York, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's seat will be up for election, as well as all 26 U.S. congressional seats and all state Senate and Assembly posts. In addition, voters will have another option beginning next year. A new law expands the state's limited absentee balloting to now allow nearly anyone to request a mail-in ballot. Lerner with Common Cause says she hopes that the change will increase voter participation. Vote by mail, I think, is going to make a very significant difference for a lot of voters having that option um, to allow them to figure out how it's best and most convenient for them to vote. So that's a big change. The State Board of Elections McGrath says staff are already preparing for mail-in voting, which will begin with the presidential primary in April. The exact procedures of how that will work are still being finalized, but will very closely mirror um, absentee in terms of application and uh, submitting the ballot. The mail-in balloting law is being challenged in court, though. A lawsuit led by Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik contends that mail-in voting violates New York's Constitution. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. In non-election news, Ogdensburg Police Department Ogdensburg Police Department has received two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to fund two police officer positions for three years. The Watertown Daily Times reports the city received a federal Department of Justice grant. Ogdensburg Police Chief Mark Carnes said the new funding is crucial to keeping its services going. The Ogdensburg, this, excuse me, the Ogdensburg Police Department has lost almost 10 officers and all of its dispatchers since 2020 due to budget cuts. The city is facing continued budget problems. Watertown City Council has unanimously approved $60,000 in additional funding to keep the Thompson Park Zoo running through the winter. The Watertown Daily Times reports a zoo official say without immediate and significant help, the zoo will have to shut down and turn over ownership to the city. The Thompson Park Conservancy took over the zoo from the city in 1991. Last month, the zoo announced it would be closing for the winter without a reopening date. It also laid off two-thirds of its staff. The Times reports more than 50 people came to the latest city council meeting to support the zoo. The council said it will meet with officials in the future to work on plans moving forward. Listening to Northern Lights right here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, we'll move from the ballot box to the kitchen, a mushroom dish fit for the Thanksgiving table. That's coming up in just a couple of minutes. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note, providing clean drinking water and bathing water to birds. That's coming up at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. The Weather Service says sunshine in places like Lake George and Saratoga Springs and Glens Falls, some light snow in parts of the Adirondacks and partly cloudy skies elsewhere today. Highs around 40 this afternoon. Maybe that's a bit optimistic. Highs in the 30s near 40. Right now in Canton, mostly cloudy skies, 29 degrees. If you're thinking ahead to the Thanksgiving feast, don't forget variety and trying something new for a side dish. Chef Curtis Hem has a simple recipe that includes mushrooms, thyme, and balsamic vinegar. Chef Curtis Hem owns the Carriage House Cooking School in Peru, New York, and is the executive chef at the View Restaurant at the Mirror Lake Inn Resort and Spa in Lake Placid. I asked him for a simple side dish that's easy to prepare and full of flavor. Chef Curtis says it's a great Thanksgiving addition to the turkey and other traditional fixings or to start your Thanksgiving party? As you get older, you appreciate a lot less fluff and clutter, you know, and this is a dish that just really speaks of mushrooms, onions, and a little bit of agridolce flavor, which is that balance of the sugar and the vinegar. Uh And it really is simple. I do like to use button mushrooms. I prefer baby portobello mushrooms or cremini mushrooms over white button mushrooms because they have a little bit 
firmer texture. They don't tend to soften up as much, and you really want to get mushrooms that are a little bit smaller and have a tighter cap. And these are just grocery store. I do believe there's a couple. I think Red Oak Foods, which is Jordan there, um, and I believe um, Crescent Moon out of Saranac Lake might also sell some um, round hard cap mushrooms mm-hmm. like this. And I don't think this works necessarily with shiitake in the same way. So I really like a cap style mushroom. So try Baby Bella if you can get those. Unsalted butter always. So we're going to heat up a pan. We're going to put some butter in there. We're going to put a mushrooms cap side down. Salt, pepper. We're going to cook those, soften them up. We're going to add a cup of pearl onions. Just honestly buy the frozen pearl onions. It works great. Yeah. There's no need to blanch and shock and peel pearl onions. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to anybody. If you do happen to find Cipollini onions and you want to use Cipollini onions that are available, feel free. That's a fantastic option. And then a little bit of sugar and balsamic. And what we're going to do is we're going to cook the mushrooms. We're going to get them to give off their juice, which takes a little bit of time. And then once they're ready and they're soft, we're going to add that pearl onion and we're going to add that sugar balsamic vinegar mixture. And what's going to happen is that sugar is going to dissolve in the vinegar and the butter And it's going to start to bubble. And as the bubbles get larger, it thickens and becomes more viscous. And it's going to coat those mushrooms, which you'll see in the picture online. Um, And that's really what you want. And just know that as those, it will have a little bit of carryover cooking. So don't go too, too far on the glaze. Kind of make sure it kind of has a little trail of a couple seconds as you as you cook it and then get ready to portion it out into a platter and serve it. And it's, it's one of those things that you can serve right away, but it's also a dish that is fantastic served at room temperature. Mm. So you can let this mm. chill out. And if that is your goal where you want to serve it at room temperature, as kind of like a pickled mushroom, then you might just swap out the butter for olive oil. Uh-huh. And that way you don't have to deal with the saturated fat component. And this could this sounds like something that could also work at room temperature for maybe like an appetizer? Yeah, it really does work great. Again, if you're going to do it at room temperature, I, I would swap out the butter for the olive oil. Uh-huh. The mushrooms are going to absorb most of that anyway, so it's really not going to be that way. But sometimes you do run the risk that if the butter is, is kind of too present, then, you know, it's a saturated fat, so it's going to kind of congeal and, and get solid. But... Yeah, this is great a lot of different ways. It's also great to raid as a spread on sandwiches. Thinking about the, de- the next day. Yeah. Oh, I love that so. idea. And I like this um, almost as much as I like cranberry sauce because I like the flavor component of it. I like that the, the little tartness from the vinegar, a little acidity, and then that sugar, and then that whole earthy note of the mushroom. And then the onion has a little sweetness to it as well. So, and this goes great, but if I like to eat just cold sliced turkey the next day and it has enough acidity to make you salivate as you're eating the turkey breast and legs. So maybe, maybe a little switch out from, from cranberries this Thanksgiving, try, try these balsamic uh, mushrooms. Sounds like heresy, but go ahead. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I think cranberries are firmly in the American table. Okay. But okay. Yeah. Fair enough. We're- fair enough. We're going to feature these at the end as well for Thanksgiving buffet. They're so good. Yeah. And it's hard not to do something that is excellent and simple at the same point in time. So, right. Well, uh, you mentioned you mentioned the inn uh, and Thanksgiving. Uh, give a plug. What are you, what are you serving? Uh, the hours on Thanksgiving? Those sorts of things, Chef. Sure. We're trying to prioritize house guests first, but we, do, we will have some openings, I bet. Yeah. And um, we have a buffet. It's a full spread. Uh, my sous chefs are responsible for it this year. And uh, we've got, uh, I want to say, uh, we obviously have turkey. Uh, we're carving turkey breast. I believe we have prime rib. We've got some risotto for a vegetarian. We've got farro salmon. We've got a ton of salads and uh, chilled shrimp cocktail. We've got a large charcuterie, local and uh, imported cheese boards. We've got a grand dessert table. You know, it's in the, it's in the fashion of what uh, the inn used to be yeah. years ago from COVID. A nice spread. You know, I think we're pretty much at the 80% mark right now in terms of reservations, but we we certainly will have some. And if you're interested in calling, find out more. Go for it. Yeah, definitely. Cool. 
Chef Curtis Hem owns the Carriage House Cooking School in Peru, New York, and he's the executive chef at the View Restaurant at the Mirror Lake Inn Resort in Spa and Lake Placid. You'll find his latest recipe and a photo of his glazed balsamic mushrooms on our website at ncpr.org. And if you're interested, you can call the View for Thanksgiving reservations, 518-302-3000. Time now is 8.30 and you're listening to Northern